Obviously, the last year or so has been insane, but on the comms front, I'm sure we've all learned so much stuff that otherwise would have taken us years to figure out. So in this video, we're gonna look at a whole bunch of hacks, tricks, tips, and techniques for live streaming and content creation for online church. Just by way of preface, this video is really aimed at your typical local church where we have tight budgets, we're tight on time and human resources. So thrifty little tricks is where it's at. High value, but keeping things low on cost as much as possible. To make this video easier to digest, I split it up into several parts and you'll see them pop up on my little baby YouTube channel. With all this stuff, I'm just gonna skim over the surface uh, to quickly introduce a whole bunch of ideas and I may expand on some of this stuff later, but only if I can keep the live stream beast at bay. Just so you know, everything in this video is timestamped in the description, so feel free to jump around to the content that's relevant to you. So I'm gonna start with one of my favorites. I mean, why wouldn't you? And that is the single camera worship hack. You can totally shoot fast paced, creative, multi-camera worship sessions handheld with just one camera, one lens, and actually quite a small room. We demoed this out at Christmas, not really expecting too much, but it came out surprisingly well. What we love the most about it was that in the final edit, you forget that the band aren't all playing together live. We shot in three separate sessions and did two takes of each song, essentially building up a six camera project. For speed, I kept things really stripped down, no gimbal, no monitor, just a shoulder strap for some added stability and my thumb on the joystick picking out the focus spot. I shot on a 50 millimeter lens for full frame and this really is at the edge of what you can shoot handheld, but the 50 millimeter does produce some nice sparkly bokeh in a small space and more so than if you went for something wider. Building up to six cameras definitely seems to be the minimum for this sort of thing. We've also tried out demos with two cameras on gimbals, worshiping in the round with everybody playing live, and basically found the same thing. Three takes, two cameras to build up a six camera project means you just about have enough footage to make it work in the edit. If you can add a third camera like we did in our Easter shoot, it just gives you a bit more coverage and room to breathe. And if you do try out something like this, definitely shoot a bit of generic B-roll to patch up any gaps or awkward cuts later on. If you do want to watch these videos in full to get an idea if this is something your church can produce, you can find the links to our Christmas and Easter playlists in the description. Okay, onto something totally free, but remarkably effective and it might make you laugh. And that's our sound absorption hack. We nicked a few sound panels from the drum booth that we're not using and strapped them to these room dividers. So this is an example without them. And as you can hear, the room is quite echoey. There's lots of reflections bouncing around and being picked up by the microphone. It's not the best sound, but this is an example with them back in, so hopefully you can hear that it's sounding a little bit nicer. Not so many reflections, not perfect, but for free, this is brilliant. Obviously, at some point, we're gonna to need to put the drummer back in the cage and reassemble the drum booth, but Caleb Pike of DSLR Video Shooter does a very similar solution, a bit more elegant using some sound blankets on stands, which should achieve a similar result. Just while we're here, we're using a shotgun mic overhead on a C-stand, which is great because you can get that mic as close as physically possible without being in shot. And one little tip is just to angle it sort of almost at a 45 degree angle so it's not pointing uh, straight down at 90 degrees. And that means when the preacher looks down at his notes and reads, you're not gonna get that big drop off in volume. I really like this setup because it just frees you up from a lapel mic. There's no batteries to run out. Uh, there's no signal drop. It's just really robust. And it also sounds really, really nice. We happen to have quite a nice microphone we borrowed off a friend, so it's not ours. One day we'll probably have to give it back and we're gonna have to go to something cheaper. If you are looking for something cheaper that still sounds reasonable, the Sennheiser portable lavalier set is really useful. Not just for spoken word stuff at church, but for getting out and about with something super quick and easy. Lock-in mic input and good wireless performance make it quite a decent option. Okay, turns out we had to put the sound panels back in the drum booth, so now we're back to an echoey room. So that is an error. 
But anyway, this one's a slight work in progress, but I'm still gonna share it because it has real potential. If you're on an older computer or one that's just not that fast, there is a way to take the strain off your CPU and get a much more robust and reliable setup. And that's to use a hardware encoder. We're using Wirecast to stream and the latest release of the Pro version supports video output to a separate display with the live audio embedded. So in this case, we can connect our Mac to the Matrox Monarch using a Thunderbolt to HDMI and Wirecast will treat the encoder as a separate display. Our final live output is now being sent to the Matrox, which is going to take care of the heavy lifting. It's gonna do the encoding instead of our Mac and it's gonna also do the upload. This particular iMac is five years old. It's pretty average in terms of specs and a bit slow now as a computer due to its age. Without the encoder, Wirecast is running the CPU at 60 to 70% of its capacity, and sometimes it spikes at 80, which is quite high and does just feel a bit sketchy. Generally, it still performs okay, but there are sometimes a few little hiccups and glitches, which is just unnerving. You kind of feel like the computer is on the edge of what it can really handle. But by taking the encoding away from Wirecast and letting this little box do all the work, the CPU is now down at 5%, which is a pretty massive reduction. It's right at the other end of the spectrum. The CPU is now doing almost nothing. So now our old slow computer has become very usable for live streaming and the setup as a whole just feels much more robust. Hopefully now we can spend less on computers and make them last longer. If there's one little caveat to bear in mind is that this particular encoder does change the picture profile a little. We're losing some contrast and saturation if we compare it side by side with what comes out of Wildcard and it also brings up the blacks and the shadows. What Wirecast produces looks pretty spot on when compared to our source videos, whereas the Matrox is definitely a bit of a departure. So we're now on the search for the best encoder, but as proof of concept, this one definitely has potential. Okay, so we actually just took a little bit of a gamble and went out and bought the Teradact VDU. I have to say, the gamble paid off. It's working absolutely beautifully. Nothing funny is happening to the picture or anything like that. The colors, the contrast, all look exactly the same as they do in Wirecast, so that's brilliant. And also the interface is really simple to use. We were up and running within a couple of minutes, so definite win for the Teradact VDU. One extra little tip to speed up your old computer um, that came from our IT guide was to use an external SSD drive as our startup disk. This was actually really easy to do. We used Carbon Copy Cloner to create an identical version of our internal hard drive. And when we rebooted the Mac in recovery mode, we just selected the new drive as our startup disk. And that was it, we rebooted and it's actually much faster. So this is a speed test before we did this little upgrade. And this is after, and I have to say, that is rather pleasant. We use one of these Samsung Evo drives, which come in all different sizes and start at about 40, 50 quid. And then we put it in a U-Green USB-C enclosure. If you've got a mirrorless camera or a DSLR, you probably already know this, but the 50 millimeter F1.8 is often one of the cheapest prime lenses you can buy, but it also produces some really beautiful results. It's a very natural focal length on a full frame, and it's a super easy way of putting your subject out of the background and creating that separation. So if you have got a lot going on behind you, it can really smooth that out and help reduce that visual clutter. So with our 50 mil lens, we've opened it up to F1.8, which has created that sense of depth and that separation. And it's almost at the point where any background could work if we tidy things up and throw in a key light. 35 and 85 are probably my favorite focal lengths, but 50 millimeters is super practical. You could use it for almost every bit of content you create for online church, which is exactly what I did at Christmas. Apologies if you're no longer feeling those Christmas vibes. And if you're shooting on a camera with a crop sensor like Super 35 or APS-C, you probably wanna go for 35 millimeters for a similar field of view. I started out back in 2012 with exactly that combination, just a 35 millimeter lens on a Canon 60D, and it opened up so many awesome projects, so much creativity came just out of that really simple combination. If you're looking for an inexpensive way to add in a few extra cameras on your live stream, 
GoPros are a pretty decent option. They work with a Blackmagic A10 video switcher, which is really good news as not everything does. You can use them as overhead drone cameras or wall mounted cameras on a wide shot. And if you put them in linear mode, I think it is, they look more like a normal wide angled lens than the classic fisheye look that they tend to create. We're using two GoPro Hero 7s and to get the feeds from our main hall into the broadcast room, we're using 50 meter and 100 meter HDMI fiber optic cables. For the 100 meter one, we needed a repeater to boost the signal so they could travel through that longer length of cable. There are a few little quirks to using them, the main one being that the HDMI feed used to cut out if you weren't recording to the internal SD card. But a uh, latest firmware update has actually solved that, so now they just work great. All the camera geeks out there will know that mirrorless cameras have evolved some game-changing specs over the last few years. Namely, great autofocus, unlimited record times, clean HDMI out, and almost no overheating, which means they're now really, really useful as studio cameras for live hosting or for capturing longer form content like sermons. The quality and the types of images you can capture are typically way beyond any camcorder you can buy for a similar price. Even something like the Canon XF705, which does look quite tasty, it has a 6 k price tag and still only has a one inch sensor which is a fraction of the size of what you'd normally find on a mirrorless with something like a mirrorless you can also use dummy batteries and audio recorders uh, which are all very useful for live streaming and capturing sermons if you are thinking of investing in a mirrorless, here are some key specs on screen that I would suggest you look out for with a couple of suggestions. These cameras won't just help you capture a sermon or a piece of camera. Uh, they will open the door to really creative projects like putting together video stories, uh, promos, gift day videos, highlights reels, drama sketches, and capturing loads and loads of generic B-roll, which will always come in useful on all your projects. We use actually a lot of B-roll in our pre-roll just to show people the community life of our church and throw out those church vibes and obviously as hybrid cameras they're great for photography as well if you're on a really tight budget and you just want something functional the sony vlog camera looks pretty interesting so definitely check that out Okay, that's the end of part one. If part two isn't on my channel yet, it will be there very soon. Where we'll look at lots more tricks and tips, including backgrounds and cloning, fun with green screen, 4K and proxy files, and loads more. At the moment, I've only got a teeny tiny YouTube channel, so if this video is worthy of a share, I would definitely be grateful, and it might help give me a good excuse to keep making these vlogs in the future. Otherwise, I'll see you next time, and I'm gonna leave you with a super important tech tip for the Teradac VDU. If you do go out and buy the Teradac, there's one setting you definitely need to check and it's the frame rate of the HDMI feed going into the back of the Teradac. It needs to be at 30 frames per second if you're on YouTube. The way to check that is quite simple. You go to System Preferences if you're on a Mac. You're gonna click the button for Displays and then you're gonna press this button for Gather Windows. And that's basically gonna give you your options for that HDMI signal. The refresh rate automatically comes up at 60 hertz on ours. It's probably the same for you if you're on a Mac. You just need to change that to 30 hertz, which is gonna set it at 30 frames per second. And that's it. If we then go into the control panel uh, for the VDU-X, we can see it's 1080p, 30 frames per second, and then we're good to go. Another way to do that exact same thing is to use the Blackmagic Mini Converter, which you can see here, which will basically convert your signal into pretty much any other format using all these settings on the back. You basically adjust these switches on the side and you can set it to be 1080, 30 frames per second and you never have to worry about checking those settings again.